Disney Classics, original programs, National Geographic, Marvel TV shows and movies, Star Wars. Now these are just some of the choices you'll get on Disney Plus. And this is the podcast for Disney Plus fans. Join Scott Murray, Regina Davis, and Nathan Chick as they bring you breaking news, programming recaps, in-depth discussions, and insightful interviews that will take your Disney Plus fandom to new levels. Welcome to the Disney Plus Streamcast. Welcome to the Disney Plus Streamcast. I'm Scott Murray, and I am here with Regina Davis. Hello again. And also joining us for a full show today, not just news, is Nathan Chick. Hello, Nathan. Hello, hello. Excited to be here. So, we're getting really, really close to the launch of Disney+. Plus, and we were just saying before we started recording that once that happens, we're going to have a lot to talk about. Because <laughs> uh, yeah. it's going to give us stuff every week or every episode uh, to react to. So we are looking forward to that. But today, uh, we've got a lot going on. Uh, later on in the show, we are going to share some top three lists and also react to the uh, Star Wars, the new Star Wars trailer, which I'm assuming is part of Nathan's news, and that's what we're actually going to start off with, is News with Nathan. You know, I felt like there might be a bit of discussion about that Star Wars trailer. Did you? Um, <laughs> yeah. So I felt like I'd leave that and start off with a few quick hits. Okay. Um, lots of interviews doing the rounds, I guess, you know, Disney here, Disney there, Disney everywhere. Bob Iger uh, promoting his new book, uh, Ride of a Lifetime. It's out. I had a flick through. Really interesting. Um, great piece in the New York Times about him and that memoir. It's talks about doing 40 trips to shanghai in 18 years so he can so they could do a shanghai disneyland and lots of other stuff in there about how miffed fox were and rupert murdoch's what rupert murdoch was whenever they had the rights to star wars uh bought out from under them um some really really cool nuggets of info in there and of course he was in the news as well recently I guess Tom Holland personally appealed to him to get Spidey back in the MCU as well as, uh, you know, all the bods over at Sony. And that's happened. If people haven't paying attention, you know, there was a bit of a divorce and we were thinking that Spidey was done with the MCU to a certain degree that, you know, maybe the the heavens would move again and they, they would get to feature Spidey in another movie. Um, they did get back to the table in return for a 25% co-financing option and 25% of the profits um, Marvel gets to have one more Spidey sequel as well as another appearance in another MCU movie and I think we're all pretty glad of that uh, especially after the cliffhanger of the last one yeah see that was the thing see where that goes. yeah so apparently Tom Holland went up to him and said please don't leave me with Sony please don't <laughs> <laughs> that's what it sounds like doesn't it i mean you know you just wouldn't tr trust their uh, track record and i hate to say it but there weren't many good superhero movies before the mcu came along i mean ones and twos for sure but you wouldn't trust it you wouldn't trust your career with that i don't think and you know in the hands of uh the wrong people something that's supposed to be like a golden goose like spider-man can end up right you know, being quite meme worthy and sink your career. What's up, Toby Maguire? Hey Andrew Garfield. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. And I mean there I think there was a large part of me that that did believe that this was gonna get resolved mm -hmm. somehow. But I wasn't gonna let myself get excited about that happening until it was confirmed, just in case it never worked out. And so I'm just so still grateful that it has. Right. Something else um, Bob Iger in the news for uh, recently was sticking up for his boys in the MCU. Um, during the press junket for The Irishman, the new Martin Scorsese movie, he was lambasting the Marvel movies, well, superhero movies in general, but we know who he's talking about, saying that those films are not cinema and he likened them to theme parks. Francis Ford Coppola, he's an alter great author also chimed in and said that he's going so far as to say they were despicable and so oh. bob Iger, 
Robert Downey Jr., James Gunn, Robert Downey, uh, Robert Downey Jr., that's where you said them. Um, all those folks are coming out. But the real filmmakers out there are sticking up for those movies. And I think we're glad of that. You know, um, I think uh, cinema, uh, the overall crux of it is that does it get people in the box office? Does it explore things emotionally? They, they, do, they do that. So whereas you'd expect people like Joss Whedon to come out and stand up for those movies, uh, whenever you hear someone like Bob Iger come out and, you know, vindicate them as well. And say uh, James Gunn on his Twitter wrote some really, really lovely things about those movies. And also in a very sort of respectful way as well, did compliment those guys. He wasn't saying that they're necessarily wrong for their opinion but it is just an opinion and you know we shouldn't feel bad for liking genre movies uh and he to that he referred uh to you know the italian american movies like goodfellas and casino he also referred to like westerns like sergio leone and sam peckinpah these things are epic these things are renowned in the pantheon of cinema and who's to say that our movies in the mcu are shouldn't be seen the same way in 20 or 30 years you know yeah. So, yeah, I have a well thought out response to Scorsese and Coppola. Ooh. Let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I was really ready for something. <laughs> Dang. It's not worth responding to. I mean, it, it's it's funny how there's sometimes there's no self awareness of how much of an old fuddy duddy you look like by saying something like that publicly. Right. Uh, being around as long as they have. And of course those two have made incredible movies and definitely have their skins on the wall. But it, it, just as a fellow artist, though, it just it just doesn't make sense to me, you know, because I think an element of your success is definitely, you know, what people say about it, how much money it makes, and things of that nature. And the MCU movies and a lot of these superhero movies are are showing that. And and by the way, not every single superhero movie makes that kind of money. It's not like none of them really? have failed. So you still have to tell a good story. You still have to make something compelling. It still has to mean something. The audience still has to like it. And it's not like all superhero movies, as we well know, are universally uh, loved by all fans. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> so, you know, it's not like everybody, uh, you know, it's not like it's, it's standing out any different from any other movie. It, it, it's uh, level of success is measured by the same things. That's, I think, exactly what makes it so confusing for me is at what point did we all collectively claim that any movie that falls within the genre that we love is automatically good simply because it falls in that genre. That's not true. Now, I really love kung fu movies. I will watch the ones that are objectively awful, but I'm not going to come out and say that they're fantastic films, you know? I think genre people will sometimes indulge movies that people who aren't really into that genre wouldn't necessarily indulge. But at no point were we like, well, if it's got a superhero in it, it's a 10 out of 10 for me. So we're going to talk uh, the current slate of Disney releases coming up, live action, all that stuff. Um, Maleficent, Mistress of Evil, obviously released this last weekend. Not Joker out of the number one spot at the box office. Just barely, though. Only grossed $36 million in North America over the weekend. And honestly, that's a bit disappointing, I think, for them. Because the original Maleficent did $70 million over that weekend uh, five years ago. And they were, had big plans for that sequel. They really thought it was going to uh, do a bit better, especially given the chops of the uh, screenwriter involved, who I want to say it's Linda Wolverton, and she did Lion King, she did Beauty and the Beast, like the originals. And, uh, you know, so again, someone with some quality chops, you know, not lacking on the talent, but people just didn't feel for it the same way as they did the the original adaptation, if you will. Kathleen Taft, the president of theatrical distribution for Disney, said, it's not as strong as we'd hoped domestically, but it's a good start for October and we have a great window leading into Halloween. Most encouraging is the fact that audiences seem to be responding very positively. Not according to the critics, 44 on Metacritic, 41 on Rotten Tomatoes, or tomatoes for you guys. Um, yeah, people are just saying it's kind of a stinker. And that's that's sad. That's really, really sad because I love the original. I thought it was great. Uh, and you can tell it definitely 
came as a surprise to them, I think, because, I mean, they really marketed the pants off of this one. Like, they really thought this was going to be it. And I it just wasn't. And I think they were genuinely shocked because I think they really thought they'd nailed it. And it just didn't happen. Right. It's not going to stop them uh, from doing even more of those. Uh, right. Pinocchio is slated to come out soon, uh, get into pre-production. They are talking about getting Robert Zemeckis on board for that. You figure on paper that's a match made in heaven. It is a match made in heaven, but I gotta say, the idea of a live-action Pinocchio gives me the heebie-jeebies. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but when you talk about live-action and a wooden puppet becoming live, I mean, if you were going to demonstrate that, I mean, I guess that's the perfect medium for it, right? I mean, I think she's talking about not necessarily the puppet turning into a person, but people turning into donkeys. Donkeys? (laughs) Oh, yikes. Yeah, you're right. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. It's a tumultuous storyline. Yeah, a kid crying out for his mother as he turns into an animal. Yeah, not, no. Oh, man. (laughs) See, the more we think about it, the more heinous it becomes. I'm just kidding. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> well, m- m- maybe it won't be. Maybe it'll be a huge disappointment. And that's what Elton John said about the remake of The Lion King. Uh, he said in British GQ recently that it was a huge disappointment to him because he believes that they messed the music up. Um, the soundtrack hasn't had nearly the same p- impact in the charts since it had 25 years ago when it was the best-selling album of the year, he said. The new soundtrack fell out of the chart so quickly, despite the massive box office success. I wish I'd been invited to the party more, but the creative vision for the film and its music was different this time around, and I really wasn't welcomed or treated with the same level of respect. This makes me extremely sad. And then he said, kids don't do drugs. Become a musician and they give them to you for free. Oh, wait, that was somebody else. (laughs) You're not an Elton John fan, then? No, it's not that. It's just he... You know, he just curmudgingly kind of sounded like the old musician from Love Actually. <laughs> oh, the Bill Nye, yeah, yeah. No, um, I think, but that's the thing about Elton, though, that that's kind of him these days, isn't it? Yeah. You know, we all know him from his, like, tantrums and tiaras, and we all know that he can be a bit of a diva, and, you know, maybe maybe it wasn't that they didn't want to work with him because of the quality of the music. Maybe they just didn't want to work with him because when you've got like Beyonce on a soundtrack, there's only room for one diva. I mean, you know, how many people can you genuflect to at one time? If you get a chance, go on YouTube and watch Rowan Atkinson, you know, Mr. Bean interview Elton John. It's hilarious. I've seen, I've seen that one. I'd quote the punchline at the end, but I feel like (laughs) that wouldn't be appropriate for our uh, our (laughs) listeners. So what else did I find out? Oh, so Deadpool and Deadpool 2 screenwriters Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick recently said to Entertain Weekly that um, Marvel has promised to let them play in the Deadpool universe R-rated, and the hope is that they'll also let them veer into the MCU a little bit and play in that sandbox too. They're into it, so more of that to look forward to. I'm not really sure how that fits in with the old uh, you know, Phase 4 and Phase 5, But nevertheless, that's exciting because, you know, those movies, you know, those two movies are pretty solid. If you like your superhero-y stuff, and we do, um, it's really nice to have a take that's not quite so po-faced as like Winter Soldier or Civil War or something like that. So, you know, I was was glad to hear that. Um, The other thing that I thought was kind of interesting this week was there's been a shakeup at Marvel Studios and Marvel TV. And now Kevin Feige is the chief creative officer of all of that stuff, mm-hmm. which means mm-hmm. our friend Jeff Loeb is out, allegedly, by Thanksgiving. He's preparing to depart, looking at unifying all of that stuff, bringing it all in with a singular creative focus. You know, I I, I knew they cancelled Ghost Rider, and some of the scuttle was is that Feige wanted that for or that character for later on when the MCU gets even more cosmic. But according to Deadline and the Hollywood Reporter, they're saying that it was creative differences. And so the last couple of um, you know Marvel TV shows that have been out there aren't probably coming back apart from season three of Runaways. They're saying that you know there's no hope for that new Warriors pilot that they made. That's going absolutely nowhere. Nobody wants it when they've shopped it around. 
Uh, we don't know about Cloak and Dagger. The only thing that's confirmed on the books is Hellstrom, which is kind of a departure from what everyone else is doing. And that might have led to some of their undoing and that, you know, people just creatively didn't like the projects that they were presented with. But I feel like having one person in charge of all of it, how much is too much? I don't know. But if it's one singular vision and maybe it gets Daredevil back on TV and gets to write some of the Battle of New York into that and the snap, uh, I'm there for it. You know, I'm... This can only be good news. I feel bad for Jeff, though, because he seemed like a really, really interesting guy, and I've mm-hmm. loved his work over the years. Mm-hmm. But um, anything that gets more quality Marvel TV on the TV, then I'm happy to have it. Jeff Loeb's not going anywhere. He'll pop up somewhere else and do something else we want to watch. That'll be phenomenal, yeah. Or read, or who knows. <laughs> I'm not mm-hmm. concerned about him. Or, or yeah. you know, write more comics. More yeah, Long Halloween I mean. or something. Yeah. You know. But I, I think it'll be good. I mean, I'm... I'm going to be hopeful and I'm going to be optimistic until a gigantic red flag starts waving in my face. Cause I am inclined to trust their judgment lately. And that's what I got for the news guys. Nice. All right. So before we get into top three, what did everybody think of that trailer that ran on Monday? Okay. I'll go first. <laughs> Cause I feel like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you guys are going to say. <laughs> I always get nervous. Okay. <laughs> I do want to mention that with the new trailer, we got that new poster. Mm-hmm. Um, if you read the billing at the bottom, mm-hmm. they gave Carrie Fisher top billing. Yeah, they did. I thought that was the sweetest thing ever. Anyway, on to the trailer. It was a, I think it was a fantastic trailer. It was an insane trailer. You've got the Star Destroyer coming up from the ice. You've got those big space battles I live for. I mean, it showed 3PO not really just being comic relief with the, you know, I just want to get one last look at my friends. And I was just like, oh, but this didn't feel like a final trailer to me. And that was, I think, my main problem with it. It would have been really cool as the first trailer, but not the last one. And I still feel like I know nothing about the story whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I understand people say, you know, don't give everything away. But there's a whole lot of space between telling us what the story is and giving everything away. Yeah, I mean, I'm in in the same boat. Um, I mean, my position is... um, from a spot of not liking The Last Jedi um, and feeling that The Last Jedi damaged my enthusiasm for this trilogy as much as I liked The Force Awakens. And part of it's because to me it didn't feel like it connected to The Force Awakens. So it was weird a few months ago anticipating the first trailer from a different vantage point because I don't think I've ever been in that position, even during the prequels. You know, I had issues with the prequels, but I never found myself, well, first of all, one connected to two pretty well. Uh, or two connected to one. So I was always excited to see where they were going to go next. Whereas this one, I didn't know what to feel. I just hope I would be invested and excited. And the one they showed at Celebration, I was pretty jazzed. I mean, that, I mean, for a teaser, I mean, that was awesome. And then, of course, the reveal of the title on top of it all, after hearing Palpatine laugh, I mean, that, I mean, I don't know how you could have walked away from that without being a little bit stoked. Um, But for this to follow, it felt to me more like a sizzle reel than a trailer. And especially when we're all kind of wondering how this is going to wrap up, because JJ's talked about how this is going to like beautifully wrap up all nine films. And it's interesting because you look at some of that, it's kind of psychedelic, it seems a little bit, because they keep popping up in these old, what looks to be old uh, locations from the first films. Um, and then Kylo and, and uh, Ray are hitting something what looks like Bespin, and it looks like they're like a Knight of Ren or something that looks like Vader, and it just crumbles. And you wonder if they're in some sort of dream state or something, appearing in all these different places. And yeah, it just, it just didn't... I mean, yeah, what you saw was cool, but you, it just didn't mean anything at the end. Um, so I find myself taking another step back, wondering, okay, what are we going to get here? And it's challenging if you don't like, if you weren't a fan of The Last Jedi and knowing this is going to try to end everything really well, man, it's tough. And the only other thing I'll say is um, I'm surprised C-3PO didn't say, I'm taking one last look at my friends. 
um, since I can't look at the ones you guys killed off in the last two movies. <laughs> Ooh. Oh. Uh, hard but accurate. Yeah, um, you know, we we know how I feel about the new Star Wars movies. Um, this really didn't do a lot to change my mind. Like, so far, I'm not excited for it. I, I'm excited for the cool visuals. And when you saw the, the, the armada of ships... Uh, with all the different cruisers and the Falcon and everything, um, that looked cool as hell. Uh, I was like, "Wow!" Um, because you know that appeals to the the action figure and model collector in me, and you know who doesn't like you know space combat? I mean, Battlestar Galactica, case in point, love it. Why Vipers? You know, Battlestars, <gasps> Cylon base stars, all of it, brilliant. Don't get um, me started on Battlestar Galactica right now. Keep moving. God bless you, man. <laughs> I knew it. you were a keeper. Um, so, you know, I that bit, cool. Lightsabers, yeah, cool. I mean, it's about what you expected, but again, yeah, where, where's the where's the sizzle? I, I don't, it's a bunch of like cool visual things and not a lot that really kind of compelled me. Like you say, where, where's the narrative? Where's, where's the hook? It's just some cool scenes, and I just and not one of them, not one of them was as cool as the Rogue One thing with the Tie Fighter at the end of the platform. Mm. There's nothing quite as <gasps> is that, you know. And or, I don't. Or, this. or you could even say there's nothing quite like Ray jumping over a Tie Fighter. Yeah, you know, you're so right. I was I was more excited for that than I was for everything else I saw. I, I wanted to love it. I wanted to feel the same way I did whenever my my cousins gave me their their copies of Splinter of the Mind's Eye and Han Solo at Star's End and said, this is what Star Wars is really all about. And you're like, oh, wow, you never see that on a movie. And yeah, you know, and I, I just didn't I just didn't get the same sort of wow, the same wonder. But, you know, I'm 40 years old and jaded, so what do I know? Well, <laughs> and, you know, full disclosure, I mean, I saw plenty of friends and colleagues that were extremely excited. You know, I have friends who did like The Last Jedi. And by the way, that's perfectly okay. I feel like that almost has to be a disclaimer in a podcast anymore because everything is so damn personal. You know, people disagree about what they like and it's a personal thing, you know, or someone's absolutely right and absolutely wrong. Um, so just <laughs> Disney Plus Streamcast disclaimer. It's okay if you like things that we didn't or vice versa. <laughs> so mm-hmm. um, at the end of the day, I mean, we're all still going to see the film. I, I still already have my tickets to see it the day I- it comes out. You know, I mean, I'm I, I am about as big a Star Wars fan as you can get. So I, I I've never been one of those jaded people that, you know, even even disliking the Last Jedi, I said it damaged my enthusiasm for the trilogy, but I didn't say it ruined my childhood or I'm leaving <laughs> Star Wars or some crap like that. So, uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's going to be interesting. Um, it is just a trailer. It is just two and a half minutes of footage. So it is going to be interesting to see um, what uh, what we think. Uh, when we actually see the film. Well, Disney Plus is a must-have for all of us because there are so many movies and shows we either love really want to see so today we're going to put all of those favorites together and create some lists it will be fun to see how we're alike and different so we've got a group of top three lists which i know is challenging and i know that when you make these lists i know that we've done this on another podcast and sometimes the disclaimer is you know the list might be different if you ask me six weeks from now uh or something but those tend to be more the same more the case i think when you have top 10 lists and you got to fit a bunch of them in but so i think three keeps things rather focused it is hard (laughs) you still have to pick three and that's what makes it challenging so the first thing we're going to start off with is your top three mcu movies uh start with three and go to the top regina so for me uh infinity war is number three because that was just my childhood coming true uh, number two is going to be Doctor Strange because I truly never thought it would happen. And I think that that movie is just a piece of artwork. Um, and Doctor Strange is my favorite superhero. Um, and then my number one is going to be the very first Avengers movie mm, because that thing was just a piece of magic. 
I don't think I'll ever see anything like it ever again. I'll never forget the moment when, you know, they are circling around everyone for the first time and the Avengers music swells up for the first time and I just lost my mind. And I just, it's perfect. You know what one of my absolute favorite Avenger scenes of, Avenger movie scenes of all time that's come from that movie? I mean, it was immediately a big geek out smile, you know, moment when I first saw it and I love watching it over and over and over again is when Captain America is fighting Loki and Black Widow is having a hard time getting a clear shot, and then all of a sudden, ACDC starts playing, and here comes Tony Stark. <laughs> <laughs> and Tony yes. Stark lands and blasts Loki right across, right across everybody and says, make a move, reindeer games. Uh, I, <laughs> I love that. And actually, I, I, I can't even usually stop there. I have to watch it, uh, the confrontation uh, once Thor shows up, when they're all fighting in that forest, there's so many great lines in that, especially from Iron Man. I could watch that 15 times in a row and it wouldn't get old. And that's the making of a great movie. Yeah. It's, it's phenomenal. Nathan, your top three. All right, so number three, Winter Soldier. Number two, Guardians. Mm, first one. one. And number one, uh, yeah, Avengers again. Yeah, so Winter Soldier, I... I think for me, I like it more than Civil War just because the story's so tight. And not only does it have those really awesome action set pieces like the scrap in the elevator, Brock R- uh, Rumlow, he's a complete scumbag. And, you know, to see him kind of rumble is just fantastic. Um, and also, I love the thing that it does with all the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. stuff at the same time. That's, I think, the closest we've had to the it's all connected thing that we would we were really hoping for back in the day. So that that's just a fantastic movie. Such a taut spy thriller. I love it. Uh, Guardians, because I didn't know what to expect with that. And I was just delighted all the way through. Everything about that movie is completely on point. There's nothing wrong with it at all. It's just such an enjoyable romp. It's, it's such a fun time. You know, whether you're a, a superhero fan or you're not, it's just so compelling. It's so buoyant and bouncy. Love it. Just, just good times all round. Apart from the bit where Ronan like murders people with his big hammer, but apart from that, it's really, really fun, and I like that. And then Avengers one again because of the spectacle of it and just the score as well. I'll tell mm-hmm. you. Um, so when I first came to America, and you know it was real hard getting over here because it was after nine eleven, and so you had to wait a long time. You jump through all the hoops, you do all the hurdles, you get all the shots. I had to have the MLR shot again. It sucked, and you know all this other stuff. And then I remember I went to a Cowboys game and when I stood up for the national anthem, because I didn't want to be that guy and I wasn't a citizen <laughs> at the time, uh, I was at Texas Stadium and the, the, the place just like swelled. Um, I felt it in my heart and I felt my bones and I started crying. Like and my, my missus at the time was like, what are you doing? Pathetic. And I'm like, no, I'm really feeling the moment. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm into it. And again, when you hear like the swell of that, um, uh, you know the avengers refrain like oh my god like the first time i got that i got chills like i felt it it's for me it's iconic like john williams you know in star wars like it just does something to me to hear that and you know just uh as well just steve rogers being awesome and getting to be steve rogers you know delegate stuff and you know give give the orders and actually be demonstrated as like the leader with all those heroes I loved it. It was everything I wanted, um, even with the product placement being really, really obvious and nefarious. It was everything I wanted. And again, so quotable, so enjoyable, so quotable. It never gets old. Never. Well, and you can tell how well that Avengers theme worked because they, and they knew it because as, as the path to infinity war and Endgame started to march its way through, especially when you get there, I mean, every single time, as if you weren't, you know, already getting hardcore feels during, you know, all of these trailers because of our attachment to these characters. You start getting into Infinity War and Endgame, not knowing what's going to happen, and you hear that theme swell after you've been through, you know, all that spectacle in a trailer. They know you're losing your mind at that point. (laughs) Right? Like, are you trying to make me have a heart attack? It just goes to show you the power of music. My three, it, and, and it was difficult because, you know, um, Guardians 1, Avengers easily could have been in there for reasons um, 
that I just mentioned, but I went with Black Panther at number three. Um, mm -hmm. because I think Black Panther was, of the standalone, I think that was probably my favorite. You know, the one I probably enjoyed the most out of the standalone movies. Um, so Black Panther made it in at number three. Civil War was my number two. I, I just really liked it a lot. I um, liked being able to see everybody. Uh, I was on the edge of my seat being an Iron Man guy, wondering if they were going to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> when it had that big fight between Captain America, Winter Soldier, and Iron Man, and what a fight scene that was. Um, mm. I still think it's funny when Iron Man calls him a uh, Manchurian candidate. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, we saw the first appearance of Spider-Man in that movie, and um, Ant-Man was good in it. It was just great to have all those characters in one film. And Black Panther. Um, I had to go with Endgame at number one. And it was a tough one. There was part of me that wanted to put Infinity War and Endgame in here just because of what I just talked about regarding just by that time we were so invested in these people. You know, we knew what a beast and uh, villain that Thanos was and what he was capable of. And then after we all left Infinity War, shocked that he actually snapped. We all didn't think, most of us didn't think, you know, it was going to come to that. Um, and then setting up Endgame, because I just remember, you know, all the trauma we went through and just how, you want to talk about geek out moment. I mean, how about that moment in Endgame when all the portals open up and Black Panther steps out and everybody starts stepping out and you're just like, oh, F yeah, now it's on. <laughs> so, you know, for, for something to build up to that kind of big moment, I had to put, um, Endgame at number one for me. I will just tag off of that and give you my top three least favorite MCU movies. <clears throat> number one is Ultron or number three is Ultron. I was really underwhelmed by Ultron. I don't think it's a bad movie. I just wasn't really into it. Like I thought I was going to be. Um, I like James Spader a lot, but you know, I don't even, you know, clearly he couldn't even save, kind of save it in some, you know, from, from being, you know, the badass villain that Ultron really has the capability of being. I mean, he was mean and he was ruthless, but eh, I just, I don't know. I came out of there a little underwhelmed and I wasn't prepared for that. Any of the Thor movies could have made this list except for Ragnarok. So I just said Thor. <laughs> <laughs> so uh thor one or thor the dark world could have easily both made this list but i wanted to give it some diversity so my number one was iron man 2 and i think i just pointed out how big of an iron man fan i am but holy crap was that a drag <laughs> and yet another t and yet it was another movie the thing that made me nuts about the iron man movies is how little time he spent in his suit in those movies it was true in one it was definitely true in three, and that's why I always thought the best Iron Man movies were the Avengers movies, because at least we saw him be a badass in the suit for a little longer than f five minutes before the villain destroys its functionality, or he just chooses not to get in it. Um, and I was watching a rerun the other day of Big Bang Theory, and, and Sheldon was trying to get Robert Downey Jr. to come to a convention he was making, and the agent said no, and he goes, I'm sorry, I sat through Iron Man 2, he owes me at least two and a half hours. <laughs> 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 so uh nathan what are your uh top three least favorite mcu movies all right the hulk um because even though it had tim roth in it and even though it teased the master uh i just find ed norton kind of unwatchable and that's just sad um doctor strange is the second because i'm i i like doctor strange hoary host of hoggoth all that stuff yep love it i just found it boring and you know with Mordo and uh, Kaikilius didn't do anything for me. Just boring. Um, and the top bad one, if there is a top bad one, Thor 2. Um, again, such a waste of Chris Eccleston. Such a great actor. And just what they do with him, nothing. Also, doesn't set up anything. Doesn't do anything else. Like, at least in Thor, it has Fury. It has Hawkeye. It has... Um, Loki kind of possessing Selvig at the end when they're talking about the, the Tesseract, it's setting up something the post credit scenes on Thor 2 do nothing it's pointless and so yeah, waste of a movie, waste of opportunity really so I knew we were going to talk about you know the Hulk sucking um, I knew we were going to talk about Iron Man 2 so mine are a little bit different Okay. Uh, my third 
is Captain Marvel. Mm. Because so wickedly underwhelmed by that movie. Mm. Oh, yeah. man. I just... And I was so excited, and maybe that's my fault for getting overexcited, but I just thought that Brie Larson, she was good, but she just didn't pull it off. She couldn't really match what I needed. Uh, and then my number two is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Mm. Uh, I, I thought the scale was too small. I, I think there's definitely something to be said for more, you know, smaller scoped character centric stories. That's fine. That's not what I want when I'm watching a Guardians of the freaking Galaxy movie. That's um, fair. I was sort of I was disappointed with how they handled ego mm -hmm. and just in general. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was a little bit wasteful. And on the note of wastefulness, my number one, <laughs> even though we were already talking about it, is Thor the Dark World, because you know, like you mentioned, Nathan, what a waste of Chris Eccleston. And, you know, in this case, for the movie, worse than that, a waste of Malekith, the character that he played, because mm. his comic book backstory is crazy. It is awesome. And they just, I, I was actually talking about this movie with my friend the other day, and he literally forgot that he was in the movie. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I was just like, so man, like, wouldn't it have been cool if they hey, had more Malekith? And they're like, who's that? That's okay. Gwyneth Paltrow forgets that she's in these movies. So, <laughs> <That's> so <laughs> sad, isn't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know what that means or how that tr translates, but that's the first thing I thought. <laughs> okay, so, uh, Nathan, your top three Pixar movies. Uh, okay, so, yikes. The, this is a tough one, actually, because it, it changed ever since I was a dad. Um because now it's like I have to give some credence to Coco and Inside Out because they make me ball all the time. So anything that you feel emotional about, that's probably quite important. But if we're taking away all the, the dad stuff, I'm going to say uh, Toy Story 2 in number three because Kelsey Grammer is just boss in that he's so good. And the whole Zerg, I am your father thing is fantastic. <laughs> um, up, just because of Carl and Ellie at the beginning, that tearjerker, I think it was said at the time, that does more in three minutes for relationships and like romantic uh, cinema than Twilight did in the whole damn trilogy. And I believe that like it, the Carl Nelly thing, it's just worth watching for that. It's just amazing. It's, it just shows you what Pixar does best. And so my top one would probably be Wally because mm. that's something it conveys a story with very little in the way of words. Um, and so, so powerful and just the dynamic between those two folks who can't speak and yet just create something amazing. And and the end credits, man, with Peter Gabriel, just so good. Like, you, you sit through and watch the whole thing. You know, you don't leave early if you're watching that in the movie theater. So, yeah, that's my top three. Wally's a good one. I forgot about that one. I love Wally. Regina? Me too. So, my number three is A Bug's Life. Mm. <laughs> because I just got the biggest kick out of that movie. I watched it a million times. I would watch it right now, and I think it would still be just as wonderful uh, the characters were awesome all the circus bugs the villain was cool he was creepy it was just and it was something that you know you think about as a kid like you know what's going on in their weird little world and so you know it sort of answered a question that i had when i was younger and you know in a really weird ridiculous kind of way and then you know wally is incredible so that's my number two because, you know, like you said, there's really not a typical amount of dialogue in this movie. And so it sort of fits into the same category as Doctor Strange for me, where this movie is literally a piece of artwork. And it's just an incredible thing to behold. And speaking of incredible, that is my number mm -hmm. one. The Incredibles. Because, oh my gosh, I did not expect it to be as good as it was. And I've watched it a million times and I never get sick of it. Yeah, I mean, it was a challenge for me um, because I have kind of a mixed track record with um, Pixar. There's movies, there's a handful, a few that I really, really like. There's some that I like, and then there's some I'm just kind of, eh. Um, so, I mean, I, there's just so many different ways I could have gone. Um, and I'll be honest, I mean, some of them, like Bugs Life, I haven't seen Bugs Life in ages. I haven't seen the original Toy Story in a long time, but nonetheless, I put that at number three because I really, any of the Toy Story movies could have made this list. 
Um, but I went with the original because it's the original. And I just remember how groundbreaking it was and how cool it was to go see that in the theater. And just the ingenious concepts of, you know, how they made toys live and talk and, you know, all the puns and everything. And, uh, and then, of course, just celebrating what toys mean to kids and imagination. Yeah. So uh, that had to be number three. Uh, Inside Out's actually my number two. Um, I thought Inside Out was a pretty compelling story. Um, I, I walked away loving multiple characters, including Anger and Bing Bong. <laughs> <laughs> How can you not like a character named Bing Bong, for heaven's sakes? We, may, we tell my dog, you just better be lucky we didn't see that movie. <laughs> you might not have been Kenobi, you might have been Bing Bong. <laughs> we're, not, we're not serious. Um, and <laughs> I, I put Toy Story 4 at the top, and it, maybe it's just because... I've seen it the most recent, and it's the thing I remember the most, but I went into that not sure what I was going to like about it. I mean, I, I knew it would be good. I didn't think it was going to be bad, but I ended up walking out of there really enjoying it more than I thought, and I agree with the people that said it was the sequel we didn't know we needed, and they did manage to go somewhere with it, and you know, I immediately had to go out and get a shirt with Ducky and Bunny on it, for heaven's sakes, because they made me laugh through that whole thing. Uh, the plush rush scene still makes me laugh every time I see it in a trailer or, <laughs> or anywhere else. Just, just those eyes, when they start, the <laughs> yeah. eyebrows go down, they turn red. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. All right. Well, you knew that we had to incorporate Star Wars into this. And as we wrap up the show today, um, we're going to do two things here. Uh, we kind of started everything uh, after news with Star Wars. We're ending with Star Wars. We're going to do the top three favorite Star Wars scenes... And then we're going to rank the Skywalker saga, Ooh. Um, which again, now see, that's one of the lists that, you know, when you get to those last two or three, it can always be interchangeable sometimes. Or sometimes, I, you know, I've talked to people who say there might be days where their top three could interchange, but we'll see what the answers are today. So real quick, I'll give you my top three favorite scenes. Um, I decided to pick one from every single trilogy and uh, from the... The sequel trilogy, I picked Ray flying the Falcon for the first time. Uh, I love the TIE fighter chase on Jakku. I love, you know, Finn having fun at the at the cannon, and I love it when they when she flips that thing around and he ma to give him in a position to shoot the last one of the last TIE fighters. Awesome. I mean, what a badass scene that was. And of course, that was also the scene that got everybody excited when we saw the first teaser. You know, uh, after he said the the dark the dark side and the light, and then it went quiet for a few seconds, and boom, there goes the Falcon on Jakku with the Tie Fighters chasing it. So, number two was Duel of Fates. I don't despise or dislike the Phantom Menace uh, like some, and I still think that's one of the best lightsaber fights, if arguably the best lightsaber fight uh, that we have seen, um, especially when the prequels were out at that time. People who've been listening to me on podcasts for the last several years, you know what this number one's going to be. Being a Luke Skywalker fan, watching Return of the Jedi as a kid, wondering how they're going to get off that sail barge alive, wondering where Luke, how Luke's going to get out of this with no lightsaber, walks the plank, flips up in the air, lands, catches the lightsaber. That sucker lights up green. Never seen that before. My head explodes and he whoops everybody's ass. That's my number one. <laughs> uh, that's another scene that to this day I still love watching. So, Regina, what are your top three Star Wars scenes? My number three is going to be the trash compactor scene. Mm, because that is something that I had dreams about. <laughs> I had never seen anything like it before, and it wigged me the hell out. I used to dream that I was getting crushed in a trash compactor. Oh, on the man. Regular. Was it yes, one of those dreams was... where you couldn't move while that was happening? Of course it was. Of course it was. <laughs> and it was just, it was absolutely heinous. Ugh. Um, I know, isn't that, oh man, I can't even, it was, I can't even tell you how messed up they were. My number two is also going to be from A New Hope, um, and that is going to be the binary sunset scene. Mm. Uh, you're hearing the force theme you're really seeing um, because whenever I was a child and any time there was science fiction and you could see that, you know, the layout of stars and planets and moons was different. Mm -hmm. That was really what immersed me in the fact that like, no, this is not happening 
on earth. And so whenever I saw that, I was like really immersed. The force theme happened and it killed me even as a child. And it still does. And then I didn't expect this, but I was sitting down and I was thinking about it. My number one out of all of them is the Darth Vader slaughter in Rogue One. Mm. Oh, I, oh, oh freaking man. That is when awesome. That happened, oh, I can you know, like, <laughs> it was just unbelievable. You know, that's a good point. I should have thought about Rogue One a little more because and uh, one of the scenes from Rogue One that I never get tired of, of watching, I, I always thought the one, my only small complaints about Rogue One is not enough turret. And I love it when Turret steps out and fights those stormtroopers. And we really don't get anything like that again. I mean, you see him shoot some things a couple of times, and it's cool, and he knocks somebody out when they land on Scarif. But, man, I just, I love me some Turret. <laughs> and I love it when he walks out there, and those stormtroopers don't even know what hit him. Uh, I also like the whole, um, are you kidding me? I'm blind! <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, Rogue One's got a lot. And, you know, and Han Solo uh, has a lot I probably could have pulled from, too. Nathan? Yeah, so my number three would be, uh, as Regina said, uh, Vader going ham uh, at the end of Rogue One. That's just such a cool cameo moment. And just in the being in the dark, and then you see the saber come out mm -hmm. and just light everything up. It's like, oh, man, something terrible is going to happen here. And it does in the best possible way. It's awesome. Um, it's not really a scene. It's the juxtaposition of the scenes. Uh, something that I was watching Star Wars again the other day. Um, the way you see Vader do his dark side, I find your lack of faith disturbing, mm -hmm. and choke a dude. And then you see Kenobi, you know, Buwan do his, you don't need to see his identification. You, you know, the different sides of the Force. That just resonated with me like so, so heavily when I was watching that. You know, there's the, the 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 dark side is all about choking a fool, and you know the uh, the you know the light side is just a little hand gesture and a little suggestion, and then oh yeah, cool, we're we're good, you know. And that I didn't pick up on that until recently, and I just loved it for that. I was delighted, and I would say my my favorite all time scene. It just inspired a lifetime of toy collecting. Trench run, you know, gold mm. leader standing by. The second you see those guys and, you know, the X-Wings engage in attack position and all that stuff, it's like, oh, my God, you know, it's, it, and it's awesome. And you already built up so, so far, you know, you've already seen the adventure of a lifetime, like every Flash Gordon, every Buck Rogers ever with the first bit. And then they go back again in space and have a shootout and down the trench. It's like this, this movie just doesn't know when to stop. <laughs> and it's just it's the best. It just layers it on. It's like the ice cream sundae with all the sprinkles and the whipped cream on top. And, you know, it's all the better for it. Really funny story about Richard Lepometer, the late, great Richard Lepometer, who is the guy that Vader chokes in that scene. Um, I had a chance to get a autograph from him at one of my very first conventions. And, of course, I picked the one where he's being choked by Vader. And he, I think he wrote something <laughs> really funny on it where it said, Dear Scott, believe in the Force, it works. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And while I was waiting in line, this guy thought he was being kind of funny. Goes, so, what it feel like to be choked by Darth Vader? And he stops, looks up right at him, straight in the eye, and says, "It wasn't real. It was a movie." <laughs> 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 so, uh, yeah. So there you go. All right. So real quick, as we wrap things up, go through uh, in order. Go at this time. We'll start from the top your top Star Wars Skywalker saga movie and go all the way to uh, the last one, the ninth. Well, eighth in this case, I should say, since we can't fit the ninth in yet. Go for it, Nathan. Okay, so from the top, A New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, did not finish, did not finish, did not finish, disqualified, disqualified, disqualified. The, the rest I could... I could care less about them. Couldn't care less about them. It's just the, it's the original trilogy or it's nothing. The others just don't add anything to it for me. Okay. Well, I don't, if, <laughs> if anything, you've probably never heard that list before and you got it here on the <laughs> Disney plus screencast. <laughs> I mean, there's some good scrapping in attack of the clones. I mean, you know, you put that in at number four, I suppose, because you know, there's some real, real great fights it's in there like... and Darth Maul for Phantom Menace, but the rest of it. Yeah. I just, it's, it's like it's that. There's that episode of, is good. Uh, of South oh, Park. Man. Where Stan wakes up one morning, everything sounds like garbage. 
He turns on <laughs> he turns on the radio and it's like, okay, well, welcome to the <laughs> show. And coming up next, we have <laughs> with their latest single. <laughs> and that's basically what Nathan just did. He said, New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi. <laughs> and there you go. <laughs> well, yeah, because, you know, for every, for every Darth Maul, there's a Jar Jar Binks. You know, for, for, yeah. for every amazing. Okay. Fantastic fight and joy because there's Jar Jar a trade Binks. federation. It's like Jar Jar Binks represents the fool in mythology, and he had a a significant role in bringing two people, two groups of people together to defeat evil. Uh, Misa no agree. So. <laughs> Misa not feeling that at all. All right, Regina. Okay, uh, it is going to be a New Hope. Empire Strikes Back. You'd think I'd say Return of the Jedi next, but I'm actually going to say The Force Awakens because that is the first Star Wars movie that I got to experience for the first time with my little brother. Okay. And so I got to sort of, you know, share my childhood with him in that moment. And it was, you know, it was really a love letter to Han Solo. It was just, it gave me so many things that I wanted. Kylo Ren is awesome. And then, so I'm, Follow that up with Return of the Jedi. Then I go The Last Jedi, Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, Revenge of the Sith. Well, my group, I would say for the most part, the top like four or five are probably never going to change or have the least likelihood of, you know, hopping one another. And then at the end, it can really go anywhere. Um, But for today, I'm going to say Return of the Jedi, A New Hope, Empire Strikes Back. Force Awakens, The Phantom Menace, Revenge of the Sith, The Last Jedi, and Attack of the Clones. Oh, My yes. biggest issue with Attack of the Clones is the dialogue, romantic dialogue. Um, <laughs> and so when you get everything Anakin says or does, yeah, when you get past that, um, you know, you've got some great scenes on Geonosis. Uh, you have the fight with Jango and Obi Wan in the rain. You have the showdown with Count Dooku. And I understand there had to be a love story to be told, but George Lucas admitted that he wasn't the world's strongest writer. And I remember Carrie Fisher or somebody telling the story one time, you know, George, people don't talk like this. And George says, well, I do. Uh, (laughs) Of course, there's the infamous thing that uh, Harrison Ford said to him, you can write this crap, George, but you can't make people say it. Well, in that case, he made people say it. (laughs) So, um, So anyway... Uh, that was interesting because uh, all kinds of variation for different reasons, um, at least for those of us who had at least all eight films on their list. So, <laughs> Wait, that's a bad thing. No, that's what makes you unique, Nathan. That, there's not, like I said, I've never heard anybody do a top eight list like that before. <laughs> so, the only other person who would do a top like, list like that is you. You pull that kind of thing all the time. We'll ask. Them. Like, you know what? No, I'm just not going <laughs> to. Well, I mean, it, it is possible that there could be a situation very much like that where if we expanded the list, I probably would be in Nathan's position where I wouldn't know where to go because I don't have any place to put some of that other stuff. We'll have to explore that one day. <laughs> we need to consult the archives. I know it's happened. <laughs> well, that's going to wrap up today's show. Join us on Twitter at Disney Plus Cast. Stream or download any episode at DisneyPlusStreamCast.com or on your favorite podcast app. All right, guys, so we're going to be taking a break until Disney Plus goes live. The next show will be on November 20th, where we plan to share our first reactions to Disney Plus, and we get to recap the very first episode of The Mandalorian. We'll also be sharing your Twitter reactions as well, so be sure to tag us with your thoughts. Thanks for joining us today on the Disney Plus Streamcast. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. The entertainment, adventure, and magic on Disney Plus never stops. So join us for the next episode of the Disney Plus Streamcast. You can subscribe to the show on podcast providers like iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify. Search, stream, or download any episode on our website. While you're there, get news updates, watch videos, follow us on social media, and check out the Streamcast Spotlight. Just go to DisneyPlusStreamcast.com. Thank you for listening. 